in the previous lecture we started discussing about uh, how to modulate surface tension. So, uh, we were discussing about uh, that how to generate gradients of surface tension may be by generating gradients of temperature for example, which is known as thermocapillary or Marangoni convection. Now, to generalize let us say that there is a free surface for the time being let us assume that the free surface is flat. Uh, in our next chapter we will see that if, uh, I mean how to modify this if the free surface is itself curved, but for the time being let us assume that there is a flat free surface for simplicity. So, let us take a small element d x. Now, on this small element let us say here the surface tension coefficient is sigma, let us say that the width is 1, width equal to 1. So, this is sigma and uh, let us say that here the surface tension coefficient is sigma plus d sigma. Why there is why this is sigma plus d sigma? Because maybe there is a temperature variation along x because the temperature variation there is a surface tension variation. So, sigma has changed from sigma plus d sigma. Now, we can write, uh, so there is a imbalance of sigma and sigma plus d sigma, so that may, may be balanced by a shear force which is tau into d x into 1, where 1 is the width. So, we can write from the force balance that is sigma plus tau d x is equal to sigma plus d sigma. That means, tau is equal to d sigma d x. So, we can write this as d sigma d t into d t d x. So, you can see that how a shear stress can be generated because of surface tension gradient and this stress can be the driving influence for the fluid flow to take place. Okay. So, uh, this is one effect that we discussed in the previous lecture, this is just a continuation. Controlling surface tension by surfactants also is a possibility. So, surfactants uh, are short forms of surface active agents are compounds that lower the surface tension between two liquids or between a liquid and a solid. Uh, molecules are attracted by interfaces. So, uh, you can uh, create uh, an assembly of molecules which are ad adhering or attached to the interfaces and uh, there are several applications of surfactants like in emulsification, in detergents like in soaps, in missiles and uh, so on. So, uh, basically adding surfactants is a way of controlling surface tension by creating a concentration change by making a change in concentration by adding surface active agents.
controlling surface tension hydrophilization. Now, this is a very important point to discuss. In many microfluidic devices, the substrates that we are using are originally hydrophobic. Like for example, PDMS, we will discuss about this like polydimethyl siloxane that, that it is in inherently a hydrophobic substrate. Now, these hydrophobic substrates may need to be hydrophilized. So, how they can be hydrophilized? There are certain possibilities. So, the fundamental principle is attaching polar groups or non-polar surfaces. So, uh, commonly what is done, uh, this, this process is routinely done in our labs that is we have oxygen plasma treatment or plasma activation. The surface reacts with reactive molecules. So, uh, you have uh, gases like oxygen uh, or you can have water, this can be ionized. And uh, so, basically you can attach polar groups on surfaces and these polar groups can impart hydrophilicity to the substrate that is the fundamental principle. Now, this particular principle uh, I mean it is good to use, it is quite cheap. So, in labs it is very convenient to use, but one of the problems is that it is not long lasting. So, the hydrophilicity that has been imparted will go away if you leave it for beyond a critical time. So, it depends on how long you are doing your experiments. If you are doing experiments over a period of time over which the hydrophilicity uh, remains then that is fine, but otherwise you have to go for a permanent treatment. So, uh, permanent tre treatment is coating with a hydrophilic material for example, pitox is a material. So, you can make a coating with a hydrophilic material, it is long lasting, it is not a short uh, time solution like oxygen plasma treatment or plasma activation, but uh, it is costly. So, uh, I mean this is of course, quite obvious that any process which is not long lasting will not be that expensive, but uh, process which is long lasting is expected to be expensive. Controlling surface tension by electrical effects, this is a very very important concept and we will discuss this in some details. So, if you recall that uh, in one of our introductory lectures we discussed that how to make a droplet move with the help of electric field. And today we will discuss the science that uh, how, how that can be possible. Uh, so, let us say that you have a electrode just look at this schematic on the top of the electrode there is an in, there is a insulator. So, uh, uh, typical insulator is a is a dielectric material and what is not shown at the top because it is a very thin layer is there is a thin hydrophobic layer on the top of the insulator. I mean that is important because you want to form a droplet on the top of that. So, if it is not hydrophobic you do not expect a droplet to form right. So, uh, you you typically have electrode on the top of that an insulator and on the top of that a thin hydrophobic layer. Typically uh, like uh, I mean the insulator even in silicon technology SiO2 can also be an insulator and you require a hydrophobic material for that case very strictly because SiO2 is actually not hydrophobic, it is hydrophilic. So, you require uh, a hydrophobic layer on the top of that. Uh, so, uh, very commonly like insulators, I mean many common insulators or dielectric layers are like perylene for example, I mean there are uh, uh, several different types of materials, even you can use PDMS as a uh, dielectric layer. So, uh, you have a dielectric layer and on the top of that you may have a hydrophobic layer like say Teflon for example, Teflon is a very common uh, hydrophobic layer. 
what are the typical thicknesses of this just to give you an idea just a rough idea say typical insulating layer thickness will be around uh, say 8000 angstrom and typical uh, insulating uh, sorry typical hydrophobic layer will be around 1000 2000 angstrom like that so that will be the i mean these are not hard and fast numbers just to give you a feel of the dimension what we are talking about now you can see that uh, like in this figure we apply a voltage uh, across the electrode and the droplet so how that is possible sometimes you can sandwich the droplet between two surfaces and on the top surface you can have a coated ground electrode like ito coated electrode for example so uh, i mean of course we will discuss about the science but you know as engineers it is important also to know that what actually we do to implement it in practice so i am parallelly talking about what we actually do and uh, like what is the science behind that now the contact angle theta when the voltage is applied changes and the contact angle changes by this corresponding formula cos theta prime is equal to cos theta plus half c v square where c is the capacitance per unit area of the dielectric uh, layer half c v square by sigma l v. Okay. Now, we will discuss about this formula in details, but uh, like certain things which we can get from this formula immediately. What are the things that we get from this formula immediately? Uh, first of all cos theta prime is equal to cos theta plus what a positive term right because it is v square. So, does not matter whether it is a positive bias or a negative bias ultimately you will get the same effect provided the magnitude is the same. That means that cos theta prime is always greater than cos theta. That means theta prime is less than theta. That means when there is a droplet, it is becoming more weighting as the voltage is applied. That is why this process is called electro weighting. So, why you want to form a droplet? Why do you require a hydrophobic layer? Because you want initially something which is non weighting or less weighting by a voltage you want to make it more and more weighting. So, uh, that uh, so that is what uh, overall we can see. Now, we will look into some more details. So, uh, there are several configurations possible. One is a open configuration where uh, there is no confining boundary at the top and the other is a sandwiched configuration where there is a configuring uh, confining boundary at the top and uh, uh, these two are the two extreme configurations. Sometimes it may be possible that a part of the system is unconfined and a part of the system is confined. So, the contact angle changes with the applied potential you can see that uh, look into this experimental picture. This is hydrophobic under no potential. So, you can see that a droplet is forming. Now, if you apply electric potential this becomes more weighting. Question is we will look into this that it does this process go on eternally. That means, if you apply more and more voltage it becomes it goes on becoming more and more weighting is it so? we will answer this question, but these are critical questions. Not only that is it reversible. So, these are the points that we will discuss. So, the mathematical expression that cos theta prime is equal to cos theta plus half C v square by sigma L v will prove this, but for the time being assume this, this is known as young Lippmann equation. Okay. 
So, uh, this young Lipman equation can be experimentally tested. So, you can see that there are two interesting observations. This red colored line with black squares on the top of the red colored line is a representative of the advancing contact angle. That means, what you do is that you go on applying the voltage and the contact angle decreases. But you can see that beyond the critical voltage, the contact line does not go on eternally, uh, the contact angle does not go on eternally decreasing, it comes to a saturation. This is what is observed in experiments. On the other hand, if you reduce the decrease the voltage from the maximum one, then the contact angle is getting increased, but you can see that the increase in contact angle is not following the same path as that of the decrease in contact angle with increase in voltage. So, there is some hysteresis. These two are very important observations in the electro weighting phenomenon and these observations mind it or not there have not yet been I mean convincing theories to explain these, these phenomena. I mean these are I mean people have come up come across with theories to explain this I will give you some sort of like some summary of what are the explanations given, but these are yet uh, the problems which are yet to be resolved theoretically. I mean experimentally these have been observed, but theoretically these are yet to be resolved. Contact angle saturation, the Lipman Young law or Young Lipman law whatever way you say implies that the apparent contact angle continues to progressively decrease with increasing uh, applied electric potential. However, experiments reveal that the apparent contact angle stops decreasing beyond the threshold value. This phenomenon is called contact angle saturation. What are the possible reasons for contact angle saturation? I mean these are some of the possible reasons. See all these are like hypothesis. I mean it is uh, I mean theoretical foundations have not been strong enough to convincingly pinpoint the entire phenomenon uh, the details of the entire phenomenon. So, trapping of charges in the dielectric layer the vertical component of the resultant electrical force acting on the liquid air interface close to the contact line or uh, I mean a limit which is prescribed by zero surface energy limit. So, these are some of the possible explanations which have been given, but uh, I mean uh, there are uh, still many open questions to be answered. Contact angle hysteresis. As we increase the applied voltage, the droplet spreads and the apparent or macroscopic contact angle decreases. The equilibrium contact angle at every applied potential during it, this path is a static advancing contact angle. If you assume that the droplet is spreading so slowly that each individual state inter in between is in local equilibrium, then like it is a succession of static equilibrium configurations through which the droplet is going and uh, the contact angle is uh, decreasing like that. As the voltage is gradually decreased, the droplet gradually regains its initial shape and the contact angles are the static receding contact angles. Hysteresis refers to the fact that the advancing and the receding contact angles are different as we discussed. This is due to random pinning of the three phase contact line by microscopic surface defects. This is a postulate remember. So, when I say that this is due to it would have been better if I said this might be due to okay. this might be due to random pinning of the three phase contact line <coughs> by some microscopic defects like 
surface roughness, physical or chemical surface defects and so on. Another manifestation of hysteresis during electroweighting on dielectric, I mean this phenomenon is also called as electroweighting on a dielectric, the name is, the reason of giving such a name is pretty clear that electroweighting is occurring over a dielectric layer, is the existence of a minimum, minimum actuation voltage for the droplet motion. This is another manifestation of hysteresis. At this voltage, the electrocapillary force is just sufficient to overcome the surface spinning effects. In general, for any surface, hysteresis is quantified by the difference between the maximum static advancing contact angle and the minimum static receding contact angle without any electric effects. This is how the hysteresis is defined, the difference between these two. So, uh, like you know, when, uh, when there is a contact line, the contact line tends to move. So, something which disrupts the movement of the contact line. So, an effect which tries to disrupt the movement of the contact line. So, uh, like for example, asperities on the surface. So, if there are asperities on the surface, the asperities on the surface will try to disrupt the movement, the uh, continuous movement of the contact line. So, it is a sort of a resistance, you can say. So, based on this, one can talk about a phenomenon which is that based on electroweighting on dielectrics or in general the electroweighting phenomenon, you can have a phen phenomenon which is called as electrocapillary phenomenon. So, electrocapillary phenomenon refers to the modification of the surface tension by presence of electrical charge. So, it is, it is a concept which is related to like how surface charge can alter the surface tension or equivalently the surface energy. Surface tension occurs to be a strong function of the electrical potential and is described by the Lippmann equation. Now, we have also discussed the thermocapillary actuation, right? That is creating a surface tension gradient due to temperature gradient and here we are creating a surface tension gradient due to electrical voltage. Now, this is a good time when we can compare these two. So, advantage of electrical electrocapillary actuation over thermal counterpart is the speed with which electrical potentials can be applied and regulated with possible characteristic time scales of even less than a few milliseconds. So, uh, the thermocapillary system has an inertia. So, it is it, it takes a time for the system to get adjusted to the temperature gradient and that is how to generate the surface tension gradient. On the other hand, this electrocapillary actuation is almost instantaneous. This also takes its own time, but the time taken is much shorter. Not only that, this is the characteristic time scale is in terms of science, in terms of technology also when you talk about the electrocapillary system, it requires integrated electrodes on a microfluidic platform. So, that is very common in lab on a chip based devices. So, it is possible, it is, it is often quite straightforward to integrate electrodes on a mic with a microfluidic system or integrate electrodes on an on chip device. It may not be a microfluidic system, it is, it is in general a chip. So, to integrate electrodes on a chip is much easier rather than to create a design temperature gradient on a chip. So, that uh, makes it uh, uh, possible uh, that uh, makes it possible that uh, you can apply an electrical field to modulate the surface tension and low electrical power may be sufficient in modulating surface tension. So, you energy wise the kind of energy that you need to spend for creating a thermal gradient, the, you can safely use very low energy as compared to that to create the surface tension uh, modulation through electrical field. Uh, now, I was talking about the Lippmann equation, 
the Lippmann equation relates interfacial tension to electrostatic potential. So, uh, you can see here uh, that you have a del sigma del E is equal to minus Q A, where sigma is the surface tension, E A is the potential of a cell in which the reference electrode is in interfacial equilibrium with one of the ionic compo components of A. Q A is the charge on an unit area on the interface, mu is the chemical potential, we will discuss about chemical potential, electrochemical potential all these things in details when we discuss about electrokinetics, this is just a definition that we are talking about, T is the temperature and P is the pressure. So, at constant temperature and pressure basically the gradient in surface tension with electrical field or electrical potential to be specific is nothing but the negative of the charge and uh, per unit area of course. So, you can see that if you can create a charge on an interface then that will create a gradient in surface tension or a surface energy with the aid of an electrical potential ok or equivalently if you have a gradient of electrical potential then the variation of surface tension with the electrical potential will implicate an equivalent amount of charge stored at the interface. So, star charge at in the interfacial location if you can alter the charge it is possible that you can also alter the interfacial energy or the surface energy. Now, we discussed about the young Lippmann equation, uh, there are various ways in which one can prove the young Lippmann equation. Now, here we have, we have put a very simple battery capacitor analogy to derive the corresponding equation. Let us look into that. So, uh, if you look at this system, so you have uh, a counter electrode on which there is an insulator. So, typically we uh, often just draw the insulator, but not the hydrophobic layer. Now, if the insulator itself is a good hydrophobic layer, maybe additional hydrophobic layer is not necessary, but if it is if there is no hydrophobic layer and the insulator itself is not sufficiently hydrophobic, then it will not form the droplet on the top of that, that we have to keep in mind. So, uh, now, you apply a voltage across the system, you can see that the voltage V is applied. So, upon connecting the initially uncharged droplet to the power source which is a battery, a charge delta Q flows from the battery to the droplet and then to the electrode. Okay. So, let us assume that there is a charge delta Q that flows from the battery to the droplet and to the electrode. The resultant work done on the droplet electrode capacitor is given by what? So, the if there is an instantaneous charge Q, then the resultant work done is V the potential that is established at that instant when the charge is Q times delta Q. Now, the potential across the capacitor when there is a charge Q stored is Q by C, right. So, you can write in place of this one uh, Vq, you can write Q by C and you can integrate this to get the total work on the droplet is equal to half C into final battery voltage square. And this you, you all know, this, this is how the energy stored in the capacitor is evaluated. Okay. So, this V B is the final potential, see finally it is charged to the potential of the battery, right. So, uh, the potential when you integrate it over the potential, the potential is from potential 0 to the final potential V B. So, that makes it half C V B square. Now, there is a work done on the battery. 
So, we have talked about the work done due to charging of the capacitor, but there is a there is also work done on the battery. Work done on the battery is the voltage across the battery times delta Q for the battery. Now, what is delta Q for the battery? A charge delta Q has flown from the battery to the capacitor. So, for the battery, delta Q battery is minus delta Q, right? If the capacitor is charged by the charge plus delta Q, then for the battery it is a loss of charge. So, the for the battery delta Q battery is minus delta Q. Now, since the battery voltage is constant, so you can take this uh, Vb outside the integral and then the total uh, work for the battery is minus C Vb square. So, what is the net work done on the battery electrode system? What is the net work done on the battery electrode system? The net work done on the battery electrode system is the total work done on the droplet and on the battery. So, that is equal to half C V B square minus C V B square. First component for the uh, capacitor and the second component for the battery. So, it is half minus 1 that is minus half C V B square. So, this work is done on the battery electrode system. So, this work is done how? This is where the fundamental science is there. This work is done at the expense of the surface energy. So, a part of the surface energy is utilized to do the work. So, which surface energy? It is the solid liquid surface energy sigma S L. So, that means now sigma S L will be effectively reduced by sigma S L minus half C V square. That is the this is the essential thing. So, now uh, if you see let us come to the board uh, to see that what is the consequence. Because some of the steps are missing in the slide. So, cos theta this was without voltage right. So, if you do not recollect how this was there just consider a droplet like this. So, this angle is theta this is sigma L V this is sigma S L this is sigma S V. So, you have sigma S V is equal to sigma S L plus sigma L V cos theta for equilibrium that is what is written here. Now, because of the applied voltage the cos theta has changed. So, it has become cos theta prime. So, what is the cos theta prime? sigma S V minus sigma S L dash by sigma L V. What is sigma S L dash? Sigma S L dash is sigma S L minus half C V square. This we have just derived by the battery capacitor analogy. So, the remember the insulator acts like a capacitor and uh, you can find out the capacitance how? Just it is like a parallel plate capacitor epsilon by D. So, if you know what is the permittivity then you can find out the equivalent capacitance as epsilon by D just like the parallel plate capacitor formula. So, sigma S L is equal to sigma a uh, sigma S L dash is equal to sigma S L minus half C V square where V is the voltage that is applied. So, this becomes sigma S V minus sigma S L by sigma L V plus half C V square by sigma L V right. What is this? 
this is cos theta right any problem here sigma sl dash no 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 this has nothing to do with i mean sigma lv has come in the denominator because you you have you have divided all the term by sigma lv not because here there is sigma lv okay so you can see this is the young lipman equation basically see this is why uh, i mean we always try to derive thing, things from the fundamental if it is simply possible the reason is that you see if you do not go through these roots it will give a illusion that the young lipman formula is as a consequence of having a different sigma lv but actually sigma lv is not changed it is sigma sl that has got changed so the contact angle is a mani manifestation the contact angle is a manifestation but fundamentally it is the effective solid liquid interfacial energy that has changed contact angle is a manifestation of that change okay Electroweighting from an energetics point of view can be uh, described by the following points also. It electroweighting decreases the effective contact angle, which is driven by the energy gain upon redistributing the charge from the battery to the droplet. This reduction of apparent contact angle is fundamentally related to the fact that a minimization of the free energy requires a maximization of the capacitance. Now question is then you can see in the formula what, what, what we have written, so you have half C V square right. So you can well say that well I do not care about the voltage, see why we always uh, in technology in electroweighting, see anybody who has done experiments with electroweighting will devote a lot of attention on changing the voltage rather than changing the dielectric. But you may think that okay, I also have half C V square in the formula. So let me make some change by changing the C also. See there are two reasons why we do not or two or three reasons why we do not actually try to play a lot with C, but we play a lot with V. One thing is the square dependence with V that means changing the V by a small amount will create a large change because it scales with V square. A related point is that because it is V square it is not dependent on the direction of V also. The third point is that changing V is much convenient or increasing V is much convenient as compared to increasing C because increasing C how do you do? C is epsilon by D. So you may say that I will reduce the D the thickness of the insulating layer by whatever amount that I want so that I will have a tremendous rise in the capacitance that is possible in pen and paper but in reality if you reduce the dielectric thickness beyond the critical thickness there will be breakdown of the dielectric layer it will no more act like a dielectric layer. So this is this phenomenon is called as dielectric breakdown. So it is therefore a uh, common possibility uh, that actually you uh, give a lot of importance to the voltage but not so much of importance to the capacitance for working with this technology. Applying a potential between the droplet and the electrode would spread the droplet as much as possible in an effort to increase the capacitance. So uh, that is an implicit way that the in which the droplet tries to in increase the capacitance 
but we are not talking about the increase in capacitance by altering the thickness of the dielectric layer. So, this is a natural readjustment to the uh, configuration. There are different types of electro weighting. So, simple electro weighting uh, refers to the change in the weightability of an electrolyte droplet, say something like this due to an applied electrical potential difference between the droplet and the electrode. Right? Schematically it is shown in this figure. So, this is simply electro weighting and what we have discussed so far is electro weighting on dielectric. So, this is a phenomenon which uh, is not requiring the dielectric layer uh, to be present. Electro weighting on dielectric or EWOD which we normally use for technology refers to the electrostatic change in the weightability of a sessile droplet resting on a dielectric film coated on the top of the electrode. The change in weightability stems from the electrostatic change in solid liquid interfacial energy that we have discussed. There is a process by which droplet attains its new equilibrium state on application of the external electrical potential and there is a dynamics associated with it. Say let us say you are applying, let us say that the droplet is sitting on a substrate and then you are applying a potential. So, the droplet will go through some dynamical states before attaining a new equilibrium state and in the process it will spread. This phenomenon is called as electro spreading. That means, it is actually spreading because its contact angle is reducing and there is a sequence of events that take that is taking place as the electro spreading, spreading of the droplet occurs. So, I will show you a couple of movies uh, I mean which concern some typical applications. So, uh, like what do we use this? Like we have understood the science of this, but what do we use this? So, droplets can be targeted to localized hot spots for electronic schooling. So, uh, if you have a localized hot spot in a device, in a electronic device, then you can have droplet which may be targeted to move to a hot spot and uh, you and you see like uh, when you are talking about a droplet being targeted to a hot spot, the droplet essentially should be designed to move by the shortest path. So, that the process is the fastest. So, this process, this type of designing or optimizing the path of a droplet given a drop the given a source and given a sequence of electrodes, this is typically done by using optimization algorithms in computer science. So, I mean in this particular application, you have actually an interface with computer science and in general electrical sciences with the fluid dynamics. So, you can see here like in this here that you have several electrodes. So, some electrodes are switched on and some electrodes are switched off. Now, I will tell you that by electro spreading you cannot make a, so by spreading of a droplet by a change in voltage that itself may not be good enough to make a droplet move. Why? Let us draw a schematic to understand. So, if you have a droplet and you apply a voltage, then what will happen? it will spread like this, it will become like the red dotted line, but the contact angle will change equally on both sides. So, that will not give a net driving force. So, on this side if the contact angle is theta 1 and on this side if that is theta 2 and theta 1 and theta 2 are the same, then there will be no net driving force because driving force is related to the contact angle. However, if you now subject one part of the electrode, uh, one part of the droplet to a voltage V1 and another part of the droplets to, a, to the voltage V2, where V1 is different from V2. So, there will be a differential of theta 1 and theta 2 and that can drive the droplet in a certain direction. 
that is the basic principle by which you can move a droplet by using a electric field. Okay. So, that is what is done in the uh, movie that is being displayed uh, here. So, you can see that a droplet is jumping from one electrode to the other. So, some electrodes are activated, then some are deactivated, then some are again activated, some are again deactivated like that. So, it is basically a pair of electrodes over which the droplet is moving successively and those pairs are switched on and off, switched on and off like that with a particular voltage. Now, droplets can act as uh, I mean there is a typing mistake it should be bioreactors. Droplets act as bioreactors to achieve rapid biochemical reactions. So, you can so let us look into this movie which is there in the right. So, we have uh, got the movie that there are two droplets. See these droplets are moving and these droplets are collisioning together. So, again look into the movie. So, you can see that there are two droplets I mean these are uh, actually colored with two different dyes. So, one droplet can carry a reactant A, another droplet can carry a reactant B and droplets have large surface area by volume ratio. So, when this uh, two droplets merge then A and B can quickly react to form C. So, this reaction can also be a biochemical reaction. So, therefore, it is possible to uh, make use of droplets as uh, bioreactors. Now, we will uh, so we have discussed about how to modulate surface tension by electrical field. Now, we will discuss that how to modulate surface tension by light by using optics. So, we have discussed about this. So, uh, I will talk about uh, like two basic mechanisms by which we do uh, uh, by which it is possible. So, one is by making a substrate by making an alteration in the substrate liquid interfacial phenomenon. So, there is a optical modulation of the surface potential through the use of a metal oxide semiconductor. We have discussed about this earlier in the context of the design of a optofluidic valve and we will discuss about the detailed science of that. So, if you have say a metal oxide semiconductor a titanium dioxide or zinc oxide semiconductor coated on a surface, then if you shine light UV light on the top of that then there will be immediate electron hole reaction starting to take place because the band gap of this titanium dioxide or zinc oxide typically 3.2 electron volts it corresponds to the uh, energy that comes from the ultraviolet light. So, there will be a change in surface uh, energy state because the surface charging state will change either there will be excess holes or excess electrons. So, that is one possibility by which you can have uh, an alteration in the interfacial energy. There is another possibility that uh, you can dynamically manipulate the liquid front through interfacial evaporation and condensation. I will show how that is possible facilitated by focus light induced excitation of suspended photothermal nanoparticles. I will show that how that is possible. I mean this has been reported in uh, one paper earlier in nature materials. So, uh, uh, strategy 1 optically modulate contact angle through surface coating. Coat the surface with a direct semiconductor oxide. Upon irradiating the coated substrate with ultraviolet light electron hole pairs are formed. These pairs can reduce and oxidize the species that are adsorbed on the surface. Recombination of electron and hole is a competing reaction. Based on the relative rates of oxidation and reduction an excess or depletion of charge can be generated at the surface and that can change the effective surface energy and the contact angle. Now, out of many materials why do you use titanium dioxide or zinc oxide as a coating? These are stable in aqueous solution since the surface sites do not react with water. 
the band gap is 3.2 electron volt which corresponds to the wavelength of light in the UV regime. The PZP that is called as point of zero potential varies between 4 and 5 pH. So, the surface is positive for pH less than 4 and negative for pH greater than 5. The flow may be specially modulated through selective coating and UV exposure. This will allow a local control of flow velocities without any fringing effects. Not only that, so you can have a special control, not only that you can have a temporal control by switching the light on and off. So, you can have a time dependent and position dependent control by patterning the surface and by switching the light on and off. What is the me basic mechanism? The water molecules in vicinity of the TiO2 surface tend to adhere to the surface. Ultraviolet radiation creates surface oxygen vacancies at bridging sites resulting in the conversion of Ti4 plus sites to Ti3 plus sites. This is the basic chemistry that takes place. These new Ti3 plus sites are favorable for water adsorption that makes this hydrophilic. Okay. Now, you can make an electrical analog of the system by considering that what is the voltage that is ap being applied across an equivalent capacitor, the voltage is H nu by E, where E is the charge of the electron. So, uh, then uh, that is the equivalent voltage. Capacitors, there are two capacitances, two capacitors in series, one is called as Helmholtz capacitance, which is because of the electrical double layer formation that we will learn in uh, electrokinetics and there is a capacitance called as Mott-Schottky capacitance. So, uh, based on uh, these two, the CH is typically much greater than CSC. So, uh, the CSC dominates because these are in series. So, based on that you can calculate that what is the capacitance, what is the potential. If you know what is the capacitance and what is the potential, then you know what is the equivalent surface energy. Okay. So, it is ultimately the energetics that is dictating the phenomenon. So, uh, now in terms of order of magnitude analysis that energy will give rise to a change in the surface tension. So, uh, then uh, you can say that uh, like if you scale the viscous force with the surface tension force actually these are order, orders of magnitude. I mean this colon which is displayed wrongly in the uh, slide, it is actually order of magnitude. So, the viscous force scales with the surface tension force and from that you can get a scale of velocity. So, if you can create a surface tension change of 0.01 Newton per meter, if you have a height of 1 micron of the micro channel, if you have length of 10 micron and kinetic and the dynamic viscosity 10 to the power minus 3 Newton second per meter square for water, you will get typically the velocity of the order of 1 meter per second, which is quite significant. So, that is one possibility. So, the moral of the story is you create a change in surface energy and the change in surface energy establishes a velocity scale, which can be established by a order of magnitude comparison between the viscous force and the surface tension force. Strategy 2. So, you can see in this strategy, what you have? you have uh, nanoparticles, photosensitive nanoparticles in the fluid. Now, you actually shine laser light. So, when you shine laser light, the local temperature will increase because the nanoparticles, what the nanoparticles will do? These nanoparticles can be metallic nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles or this can also be nanoparticles made of carbon nanotubes, whatever. I mean these are, uh, these can be nanoshells or nanotubes instead of nanoparticles. So, these particles will absorb uh, the energy from the laser and that energy will be transmitted to the liquid. Once that energy is transmitted to the liquid, the liquid will get evaporated. Once it is evaporated, it will <coughs> flow in this direction, see the cartoon. This the, the liquid becomes vapor and this vapor when it comes to the interface, 
this will condense. So, it will form droplets and that droplets will add to the previous liquid and that will change the contact angle. So, basically the vapor in the relatively cold air condenses into droplets in the form of liquid layer interface. The droplets collise with the original bulk liquid body and the liquid air interface advances because once the droplet collises with the bulk liquid then what happens is that the contact angle changes and the contact angle actually decreases. So, that gives a greater driving force and this starts moving. So, this is again a beautiful phenomenon. So, if you combine this phenomenon with the surface coating, surface coating is a surface phenomenon and this is a bulk phenomenon. So, you can uh, combine the surface phenomenon with a bulk phenomenon. Uh, so, by using the optical technology here the optics is coming from laser. So, it could also be UV source or any other source. So, from that actually the nanoparticles are here the passive media which are accepting or absorbing the energy that is coming in the form of light and that is getting transmitted into heat almost instantaneously and that is giving rise to evaporation and condensation. So, what are the major tunable parameters? The light illumination power, the laser power, the micro channel dimension, the photosensitive nanoparticle concentration, these are the parameters which can be tuned to alter this phenomenon. So, it is possible that by using light one can create a change in surface energy, one can create a change in the bulk also that will eventually translate in the form of a change in contact angle and these two technologies either individually or combined together can give rise to an optical modulation of the interfacial phenomenon. So, it is possible to modulate uh, the surface tension optically. Okay, uh, so, we stop here today and we will, we will start with a new chapter uh, from our next lecture. Thank you very much.